the Renaissance, a time when society's willingness to engage in conversation produced a great spirit of innovation and discovery. One of these innovations was a technique of two-point perspective drawing, where lines are drawn from vanishing points to provide the angles necessary to create a more realistic structure. They are called vanishing points because once the drawing or painting is completed, the individual perspective points disappear. It was perspective drawing that helped artists place their subjects in more realistic and natural spaces. Today, the desire to place people in more realistic and natural spaces is once again the topic of conversation in West Michigan, not just in drawings, but in the real life of a community. Nobody wants to be alone on the street or homeless. I sit up here because I don't have nowhere to go. These people don't want to be helped too, though. you got to right. take that into consideration. Right. We never thought we'd be this far down being homeless. I got an idea. I mean, if there were some homeless people here tonight, I'd probably say, you know, maybe next week, get out and get a job. I didn't think things would be this way. I'm a skilled worker. And I've been staying in all kind of empty houses. I mean, do they want help? I, I need some help. The first thing you need to look at is your own heart. Now, I look at homelessness as people who have lost something and need help regaining it. So I, I don't think, you know, we can afford to say no matter who we are, that it's not my problem. I honestly am so ignorant to the facts of homelessness that it's it's hard to even have this discussion because I know so little about it. I mean, it's so far from me that I hardly, I mean, I know it exists, but, and, and you ask if I've ever seen it here, I mean, you know, I, you don't see it that much in Muskegon, at least I've never seen it, I've lived here my whole life. To be honest with you, I really haven't noticed any. I guess I don't look for it, you know, um, maybe I should. But I don't notice it. I mean, maybe I just don't go in the right spots or, you know, I don't know. I couldn't tell you why people don't see it. I can tell you the ways we see it. Um, we have a building inspections department. Periodically, we'll find people moved into boarded up structures. Um, I just remember a, a year ago on Christmas, we had a lady that was in the house with no water, no sewer, no electricity, and we found her in the house the day before Christmas. Uh, she had no place to go, you know, and. Uh, we let her stay there until the day after Christmas, Christmas, but we had to put her out. We can't even go to every woman's place, uh, rescue mission, because they don't have any more room. So we just out here in the park. That's like this man coming down here now with my girl Kim. He lay on the bench on that picnic table right there and sleep every night. Most of these folks in this park is homeless. The reality is, I think, because not having a house in a lot of a lot of socioeconomic classes, there's an impression that that means you are lazy, weak, dumb, or something. There is a presumption that we don't talk about it a lot. The fact of the matter is, a lot of people in this country, I believe, are a couple paychecks from homeless. And the more we begin to realize that the reason we need to talk about it is that when we drive down a street and we see people on a corner with bags, they may have just been to TJ Maxx shopping, or they may be moving. I've never had to walk around a, a, a dangerous, scary city, try to uh, find a safe place to stay. And so I, I have, have forced myself to do that, to try to put myself in that position. The one I chose, the one I chose to go to is a building that sits up on, it's a warehouse type building, it was along a railroad track at one time, and it sits up about this high. And I thought that would be a good building, I think if you'll think you'll know which one it is. <laughs> we walked down there last night and there's fencing underneath that building, but not all the way because other people have thought that was a pretty good place, and they've taken the fencing off. Hmm. And the most moving, one of the most moving reactions was that at that place was where we found the baby bottle and the booze bottle sitting next to each other. A lot of the kids that go to uh, 
Muskegon Public Schools and Muskegon Heights have been homeless at some time or another. And um, poverty is a huge thing that isn't really ever going to leave us, but we can help individuals and love them and help them through the situations that they're in and give them hope and a future and a promise. I kind of look at it like um, this young person walked in carrying a can and on the top said homeless. You open that can up, you've got a whole lot more worms that crawl out of there. When I met my very first homeless family, I was able to sit down and find out that true elements that caused that situation. You know, it wasn't a generational type of homelessness. It was a, a circumstantial or situational type of homelessness that one thing led to another and it was a dominoes effect that caused this and it was it really um, made me realize that I didn't know anything about homelessness or the types of homeless that were in our community and, and it really opened my eyes up. I think one of the problems is, is that people that don't experience uh, homelessness in their immediate family will have a problem with it because they don't see it. They don't think it exists. You know, but we're here to tell you right now that it, it does exist. I don't understand somebody with a, you know, in my situation with a family that somebody in it can be homeless. I mean, this can't happen. My mom um, passed when I was very young, for one thing. She passed when I was eight years old. Then we moved with my grandmother, and my grandmother passed when I was 14. So my sisters and my brother raised me until I graduated from high school. And then we all kind of separated. And once we separated, then we just I was just pretty much out there by myself. Um, we had to move out of there because we couldn't pay the rent no more. And we moved in with his nephew um, in October. And we stayed there till about two weeks ago when we moved in here because his nephew has two children and protective services stepped in and so that we couldn't live there. It was only a one family home. So that put us out and I had to get rid of my cats that I've had for six years. I spent nine years and something in the military altogether. I served twice in Vietnam. As great as the United States is, there shouldn't be any homeless people at all. And so we do have a homeless problem in this community and people need to understand that and they need to help out. And, and the biggest thing is really the families, you know. And I look at all these boarded up houses that are sitting around and they just, you know, they, they're a blight. But, you know, there's plenty of families that if, you know, if you put them in there and you help bring it just to standard so it's livable and say, you know what, if you'll stay here and you'll get a job and you'll just put the money back into repairs instead of paying rent, we'll, we'll, we'll let you go with this thing and then at X amount of time you made these repairs, we'll turn the house over to you. This is one of the homes that the homeless stay in when they don't have any place to go. They come in periodically and they break in the back and they stay in this basement of this home. A lot of times they can't make it to the mission or the mission is full and they're not, they don't have anywhere to go so they find places like this. I walk everywhere I have to go and uh, it, it, it just been one house uh, after another one, but I keep telling my mind things gonna be better, and I and I keep asking God, God, you gonna see me through this. Keep working at it one day at a time, and just just keep, you know, just keep the faith that, that one day that. Everything's going to be all right. And it, it has for me, it's just been truly, like I say, a truly a blessing. These past two years, I was here in this program, like, um, and two, I came here in 2001. And since I've graduated and completed the program, I had so many different changes in my life. I mean, one after another, till it was almost kind of scary, but. For me, I looked at the life I was living. I was 40 years old and basically have lost jobs, went through a divorce, wasn't doing good at all. I had a drinking problem, a bad drinking problem. So I needed something. And even though I didn't want to come to the rescue mission, it was the best thing that happened to me. 
I don't know anybody who's homeless or you know or in our situation who wants to be homeless it's something that you know when you reach like an ultimate low or something like really drastic happens to you and you have nowhere to go you know no one to turn to right. some people just give up I think most homeless people probably been um, neglected or you know something tragic happened in their life say a couple of family members mom dad died and you know they're back against the wall so Basically, they just, you know, survival of the fittest. They just, you know, feel like it's them against the world. Ma the majority of the homeless population, you know, are very embarrassed, you know, because of their condition. And shame is one of the major blocks and hurdles that we have to break through in order to help, you know, some of the homeless people. Yeah, I, mean, I, I feel sorry for them. But on the other hand, and this is just me now, but these people that are poor and homeless, and if they're at this mission and they gotta go out in the morning and they can only come back at a certain time, then maybe during the day you should hustle out and find something to do, find a job. Uh, if it's minimum wage, so be it. And you know, save your money, and, but you gotta, you gotta get up in the morning and you gotta put a smile on your face and you gotta go out and do something. I used to go to my county commissioners, and I, you know, because everybody'd say, "Well, we don't have a problem here. There's plenty of services, and there's this out there." And, and I said, "Let me take everything away from you. I'll let you keep your car, but you can give me your bank cards. You cannot go home to your house. You don't have a job. You don't have what you got is what you got on your body right now. Now you go. This is your community. This is where you live. You go in this community right here in Muskegon, find a place to stay tonight, start looking for another job, find a new place to live." And we're going to start from ground zero and see what's there. See what a monumental task that is. How do you address a problem when you can't really put your hands or finger on it? I mean, what would an average person do to make it better for somebody? Offer your time, maybe just a few hours a week to help the homeless, whether it's um, just serving, you know, at a food pantry or whatever, or helping keep things in order at a, a food bank or anything, just offer some time. I'll go take some of my money from my bank account and buy them clothes. Instead of making them, I could buy them some new clothes. And if they have some kids, you can buy them some toys. What I think about homeless people is that I could help them and take them to our house and let them take a bath and donate clothes to them. Don't let the church off the hook. And I think, uh, you know, if you go to the church and you ask uh, the leadership of the church, where do I go to help the homeless? And they can't tell you an organization that help the homeless. You really need to find another church. I think you can't let the schools off the hook either. If you're going to make a commitment to yourself to be aware, then you have to make sure that your public places and your facilities in your community are also it, aware. You know, do we teach classroom teachers? Do we help our social workers or our clergy when they're in, when they're in um, school to understand the complexities of, of homelessness and, and sure. is that a part of the fabric of the life that they that they under, they come to understand because it's a huge surprise if, if we don't do that you know people need to stop by these missions and you know and ask for tours and see what it's really all about you know stop guessing so I feel Dr. Martin the king of dream that everybody should help people no matter um, what and that it'll make our community to come together more and and um, show a mosquito how to love. We're all human, and we all have a special thing that we were born with. Uh, in Spanish, we call it un don. God gave you a don, which means He gave you something special, each one and every one of you, to do. And so, just use that and go out and work and volunteer. <laughs> Everybody has a little something to offer. Continue to just give. And I know with talking about this, um, it's really put a soft place in my heart. And I'm going to be more conscious of, you know, mm -hmm. things that I have and that I'm not really doing anything with. Because I still say the biggest problem in this whole county is, is a lack of knowledge of it. I mean, it's uh, people well, just I, don't know. I think having this conversation, though, obviously, because... 
you all know that you're going to tell your friends, oh, I sat in on this conversation about homelessness and maybe get their thoughts and views. They may tell another person, not to say that anything's <clears throat> going to come of it, but I think maybe some more people will be just that much more aware about, of it. I don't think our goal with homelessness need to be to improve homeless situation. I think our goal needs to be to end homelessness. Without the continuum of care collaboration, programs such as the Transitional Living Center, known as TLC, Every Woman's Place, Bethany Housing, the Veterans Center, and others would struggle to exist. These programs help individuals who find themselves homeless for a variety of reasons get back on their feet and live productive lives. Well, the day that I found my new home, um, when I walked in and I was like really surprised. It was so clean and new carpet and new paint and job and everything. And I can remember leaving here. I was scared because I was so used to being around all the girls and stuff. And it was just kind of scary that first two nights. So. But once I got settled in and my kids would you know, come on the weekends and just start day by day feeling like home. And I've been there a year now. It was a year in November. And I'm enjoying every minute of it and still decorating and still doing new things to it and try to make it, you know, more livelier and just, it's great. I love being in my house. I don't have to worry about getting put out or people telling me, well, I can't stay there tonight or, you know, it's just, it's a blessing. We hope that you will engage in this exciting conversation and choose to be a part of the Muskegon Renaissance. Many people don't have the ability or the skills to even go and ask for help for themselves. You know, there's many, many things that we can do, you know, if we want to help people. If we're afraid, you know, there's people that will ride with you, you know, while you ride a person around to do the things it takes to help themselves. We have a homeless shelter and we work with people. And one of the things that really astonished me once we got into the business of working with homeless people is the, the fact that so many of us have, have really missed the mark when it comes to looking at these people and thinking that they're not just doing something because they're lazy. Many people, it's a task and it's a chore, you know, to fill out a document or to sign things. And if they can't read and write. So, you know, that whole notion that, you know, you can't help, you know, if you don't got money, you know, time is money. Just pick up the phone and call your local homeless shelter. Some of those people, they don't even try to help. Like, they have all of this money, they like have a whole bunch of cars and stuff, and they have all of that money and they can give it to the homeless, but instead they just go buy another car because they don't want to help them. They think they need to fend for themselves and they think it's their fault that they lost their house. I try not to be close minded anymore about homelessness myself being homeless. <laughs> Once you get to know these homeless people and you look at their circumstances, they're actually very valuable members to the community as a whole. We collect cans for a living. That's how we survive. You might want to write that in there somewhere. That's how we survive. We collect cans. I think that um, that the homeless people um, could um, pay their own rent and get their stuff so they can survive by ourselves if they stay in school. We give so much money, let's face it, overseas. Other countries, give, 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 give. Mm -hmm. half, the, half those countries don't even care for us. But boy, take that money. Mm -hmm. right? sure. Well, instead of maybe giving all those billions of dollars, you know what, then spend some here. If a family comes to you with the burden of being uh, underemployed or unemployed and homeless, and the first words out of their mouths is, how long can we stay? And I have to turn around and say, 90 days. So I just put another monkey right back on your back because now you only got 90 days to get your life together and get out of here and do that. What if your kid would have been out on the street? Wouldn't you have appreciated if a neighbor maybe would have gave them a meal? You always should think in terms of what if because you never know what can happen to you. You never know if 
you know, if you do have a kid that age, that maybe one day they'll decide that their life isn't right and they'll leave and they'll be homeless. Now here's a mother who has to take one child and go to the women's dormitory and her 14-year-old child has to be put in with a dormitory full of men. And that's really scary. I want people to know that we are human. We made bad choices, you know, but we still are caring. You know, we still care about what goes around. We still care about the people in our community and we care about other homeless people. And that's what they need to start focusing on. Comments. You can buy some new books and teach people to read little by little every day. If you start volunteering and helping somebody that's less fortunate than you are, then I truly believe that you will be blessed in return.